Okay, so one thing that Mudrug asked me, he said, well, let's see some faults. Let's see some earthquake surface rupture, you know? So, uh, and also I wanted to talk a little bit about structural geology. So, what's the geometry of active faults? And most people know these subjects from your structural geology classes. But really what we care about is the fault trace geometry. So, how, you know, how straight, how much does it step and bend? And then what happens in terms of offset along it? So that's what I mean by a slip distribution. And we know these are, and, and then the other thing we care about is the original form. What did the rupture look like today when it happened? And then how did it erode over time to get covered up? Because when we go to paleoseismology, we have to, in our minds, go back in time and say, okay, well, what did it look like 500 years ago when this earthquake occurred? And what happened after that? So original forms and initial modifications to the rupture. So here's some examples. I'll just go through. I have mostly pictures uh, and a kind of a tour of, you know, dry slips. So we'll do Denali earthquake from 2002 in Alaska, a little bit of Chichi for thrusting, just one slide, and then El Aznam was the famous uh, thrust faulting earthquake in Algeria, and, and kind of a blind rupture also didn't really come to the surface. And then I'll show the Bora Pika normal fault in earthquake from, I should say, 1983. So, Denali earthquake was, uh, occurred in um, Alaska. It was 7.9 earthquake on this great, uh, this Denali fault. It was a big strike this fault, almost a plate boundary in the interior of Alaska. It's a right lateral fault. So, it let this piece of Alaska, southern Alaska, move to the uh, the west, while the basically northern Alaska sits. And it's because of the collision in southern Alaska, we had subduction, but there's a microplate that collides in southern Alaska, so it drives southwestern Alaska to the west. And so we get this localized deformation in the interior. So, uh, and fortunately, the very few people live there. So there, there was a big earthquake, but it didn't cause a lot of damage. And there was uh, some uh, claims of success because there's a famous Alaska, Trans-Alaskan Pipeline. So they take oil from northern Alaska, from up here, all the way across Alaska to southern Alaska, where there's the uh, refineries and the ships. And so early work by famous people, Carrie C., Lloyd Club, David Schwartz, these people we know are like icons of this work, they were young, you know, 20, 25, and they were working for the companies that were characterizing the corridor for where the pipeline would go. And they knew the fault was there. And they said, you know, we better be careful. We just think it have an earthquake. And so it did have an earthquake, and the pipeline didn't break because they successfully, pretty well, anticipated the amount of offset that could occur. So sometimes, you know, it works. Sometimes we get it right. Not always, but once in a while. Okay, so this earthquake, it started off with uh, actually a foreshock, which was on a, a thrust fault here on the west side. So it was a little thrust event, about a magnitude 6, and then it uh, ruptured along the fault, and it ruptured most, so the green is the foreshock, and this is the foreshock focal mechanism, so green foreshock aftershocks. And then the main rupture went like this. And what was really important about it is that it it went along the the main Denali fault. But the main Denali fault continues here. But the rupture actually went to another fault. So sometimes we have to be careful with main faults. We say, okay, this is the Denali fault and this is the Pochunda fault. But the earthquake didn't care. It said, I want to go this way. So it's not, you know, it doesn't follow the rules, right? So just names are semantic, right? So, but something important about the transition occurred. So here's the mapping of the rupture. Okay, so most of this comes from a paper by a USGS scientist named Heisler. And uh, I, I have the link, I can give it to you if you want. But um, very nice work to characterize the earthquake geologic effect. So that's what I'm showing. So. Here was the South Susitna Glacier Fault, the part that broke in the foreshock. And then it ruptured unilaterally, pretty much, along like this. And so the numbers here 
zero to 300 or kilometers, so 300 kilometer long rupture, so very long, and kind of similar to that movie I showed, the San Andreas one, it would look like that, about the same length of rupture. And then this, then this is the slip distribution, so this is distance in kilometers versus horizontal slip. And so then what they've done is they measured, they went to all these sites, and they measured the offset of these features with this uncertainty. So what you can see is it's not symmetric. It has some, you know, slow increase and then some drops and then a peak in here of eight meters and then it kind of comes down pretty fast. And so what's interesting is remember here where it jumped off the Denali named fault to the Totunda fault, it actually was pretty abrupt decrease in slip. Like down here, it's only two meters anywhere on Tuchunda, whereas nearby on the Denali itself was as many as eight. So complex behavior of the fault surface during the eruption. Yes. I'll show you many pictures just now. Perfect question because the next sequence, I'll just go visiting these some of these sites. They have great photographic documentation. And so just remember, the positions are in kilometers from the west, okay? So zero going this way. So here is an offset, and you see they went, they had helicopter support, and they just went to many places. And so you can, so, so the fault is here, and what they mapped was this edge to here. So there's kind of a small drainage or something that was offset like this. So it says... 1.5, 1.4 meters, plus or minus 0.1 right lateral and 22 centimeters up to the south across the Denali Fault, the uh, city rise along the fault. Okay, so that's just an example. And this is at 23.22. So, so just one moment just to show. So 23.22 to go up, that's like right, it's one of, it's like one of these guys right here, okay? Question was yeah, it's uncertainty. So they're really just taking the idea of the, the the side of this little channel. They're just taking this and it was offset like this. But there's a little uncertainty, you know. So 1.4 meters, about this much, right? But about 10 centimeters, they don't know on either side. And so this is actually a big debate, and a lot of work I've been doing lately is how do you estimate this? You know, because the topography has some roughness also. So when we come back, you know, it's, you know, it's like kind of bent or something. So there's natural roughness, uh, and then there's just the reconstruction uncertainty. But, you know, 0.1 out of 1.4, it's pretty well defined. Very good question. Okay, so let's look at this. This is on the ice. So it ruptured through a glacier. So this is... Uh, so there's helicopter pilots here. What's interesting, and we'll talk about this in a few days, but these secondary effects from earthquakes, this is an avalanche. I'll show you in a, mo in a moment, but the, the mountains around the glacier shook so much, they sent the debris down across the glacier. But the glacier also broke in an earthquake. And so this one, I don't, there's no obvious offset here, but one meter, one 0 0.06 plus or minus 0 0.05, so very precise. And this is 68.08, so this 68.08 is like right here. This this one it must be because it was one meter, right? So that's that one. So here's just another picture of the fracturing on the ice, and this is a pull apart. So one lesson why I'm showing this is just to, to remind us that these ruptures aren't perfectly planar. You know, so this rupture comes in on the left here, and it steps over to the right and keeps going. So it's a right step in a right lateral fall means opening. So you see the subsidence in the step over. Okay? So here's an example from 80, kilometer 80, and it's 2.7 plus or minus 0.9 and 0.34. So this was asymmetric. So they... One side that had a lot more uncertainty on than the other. But what the flags are doing is trying to show the main feature. So it's up this little gully and over to there. So on one hand, when you first look at it, it looks like it's quite precise, right? It's just the flags just line them up. 
but I think they had some uncertainty about, well, maybe this thing connects, but I don't know. This seems like uh, quite... Oh, 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 I see. No, actually, the 1.95 is the main trace, and then the total uncertainty is because these secondary faults appear. That's what it is. See this? One major fault strand, 1.95 plus or minus 0 0.1, that's this guy. But the total faulting is these guys here add a little bit more, up to almost another meter. So this is kilometer 80. So here's a up a kilometer. This is five meters of offset, and you see it's tearing the ground and making this big hole here. So, uh, you know, this, when we think about, uh, remember I was saying initial, original forms and initial modification, you know, this, now can you imagine, go 100 years from now, what will this look like? You know, well, well the, this edge will become smoother, and this edge will smoother, and will be filled in, but you could still look for this rubble at the bottom, right? And so this is the mental image we want to have when we're doing seismology is looking at this rough landscape that forms right at, after the earthquake, and then we bury it, and then we use another one. And so this is uh, kilometer 88.54, and this is a view from the air, and I think that last 88.54, I think that big hole is right, right like this one here. And so what you can see is the fault comes in, and if you see here it takes a, a step to the left, so it's a step to the left on a right lateral fault. That means collision, right? It means because this is coming in like this and this is coming in here. There's local contraction and uplift. So you see, as we expect, a little mound, a little mound is built. So that's pretty cool. And then for some reason, there's some fracturing off of the side here. And if you think about the right lateral, uh, it's it. You know, we don't know why this would exactly happen here, but some secondary fracturing that's not on the main trace. The final thing that's important to see in this picture is as you go this direction, you see it really looks like just one event, like this surface here is not really disrupted, right? But as we go over here, see there's a much taller scarp there. So that's an older landscape showing multiple ruptures across the, the landscape there. So this is how we can use geomorphology to and sort of document repeated ruptures. And one of the fundamental things we see is that a lot of times earthquakes happen in the same place time and time again. Okay, so then back onto some ice. And so here you see the ruptures coming in and it's a very much discontinuous right stepping. And every time it steps to the right, it causes some opening and subsidence. So very kind of classical discontinuities for fault frequency bar IF form. And then here is on the ice, same area, and this is oblique slip. So you can see this shape right here matches this one. Or you can say the bottom would go to there, right? So this is oblique, and so they say Crevasse is offset 3.52 meters right laterally and 2 meters vertical. Okay? And so this is from kilometer 102.9. So we keep going. Here we are at kilometer 142. And this is a little harder to see, but the flag helps. So there's a flag there, and it comes, the fault comes through, and there's another flag there. And so they say erosional swale. So swale is like a low, low area in the landscape. So these two low areas, you know, can offset like this. But what does he say? 5.1 meters is a big offset. Um, and so the fault zone, the rupture zone is one meter wide. And what you can see, and this is important, even though this is a Arctic landscape, uh, the vegetation gives the ground strength. And so we call this turf, you know, so the grass is holding the, the ground together, and so it defines these blocks. And so then if we vary it, we might look for these curving shapes. No longer would we see the grass anymore because it might be dead if it was buried in the future, but we, we could maybe uh, 
had the idea, oh yeah, it had vegetative strength was holding the blocks together. And so in a place like Java, this would probably happen, right? If you rupture through trees and fields, you have a lot of roots going to hold those blocks together. So here is the peak offset at kilometer 182, and it's 7.5 to 9 meters, and so it's a view from the helicopter, but you can see the stream comes in, boom, and leaves. So very sharp just uh, connection, although you can see up close that they, they had some challenges, you know, 7.9 to 7.5 to 9.1, so it's a 1.6 meter uncertainty, but huge offset. So then we come down, and this is now on to Chunda Fault, almost at the end. So I went a long way. So it's 297. The last one was 182. Okay, so I went 100 kilometers. Because I want to keep the lecture going. And so here, um, the fault is this line here. And the edge of this little tiny terrace riser is offset. You see like this? And so that is uh, 0.65 meters horizontal. So this is one of these guys. And then the south side went up a little bit, right? So it uh, just shows small offsets at the end of the rupture. So that's the, that's the direct effect of the earthquake. But then there were secondary, what we call paleointensity indicators, that are not on the fault, but they tell they say the ground was shaking a lot. And so that includes like the police van he's standing there where the ground was shaking so much the roads pulled apart. And then also we had mud volcanoes. So we shook the ground so much that the fluid pressure in the sand below some mud basically was high enough to erupt all the surface. So these are classical we call intensity measures. So you don't know where the fault is. You could have a fault anywhere in the neighborhood, but the ground shook a lot. And so sometimes these are useful because you can see them, but you, and you might be able to date them easily, but you can't associate them with a single fault all the time. So here, you know, in that earthquake. So here is some of these crazy uh, debris flows. So the this is a view from the helicopter or airplane on the left and on the right, and the mountains are very steep, and they shook so much that the, it failed, and it launched all this rock down onto these rat, these glaciers. And here's this one is really amazing. So it came down. It was like a storm, you know, as they say in German, a storstrom. So it's like a rock storm. It's like, oh, goes down. Whew. And it, it has so much kinetic energy, it can fly across the glacier, and it actually doesn't erode the glacier. So you see it's not tearing this moraine, it's just going <laughs> And uh, so this obviously, in a populated place, could be very devastating, right? Because if you had a town or a village there, it would be hit by the landslide that was caused by earthquakes. So kind of a secondary hazard. Fortunately here, there was no people, and it was very striking color difference between brown rocks and white glaciers. So any questions about Denali? Almost all of these are tape measures. Yeah. But uh, in the future, there's a lot of interest in getting total stations out or terrestrial laser scanners so that you can really capture it because otherwise it's just these more, you know, um, just the person takes a picture, it's pretty good, but, you know, if you have a, a high-resolution topographic map like a laser scanner, you can have a 3D model of every one of these offsets. It's very useful for teaching, but also for, you know, more discussion. So, because one issue, right, is somebody could disagree. They could say, well, I have a totally different idea. I think this is one meter because you didn't, you know, you didn't see it the same way I did. And, but if you only have a picture like this and the tape measure result, it's hard to argue, right? But if you have a really good 3D model, maybe you can argue in a, you know, 
from the computer. But still, we always, I think, want to say the geologist has to get out in the field. Usually, has the best chance of getting the best answer. But documentation can be improved. Good question. Okay, so let's go. Just a few points about. Oh yes. Well, good question. So what? What? It's easy for these guys because it was such a big earthquake. So they had money. So they had helicopters. So they flew, and they also they. So one thing is they could look. The second they used their the brain power of the geologists, and they said, well, where is the evidence of old the rupture? So they found the old scarps, and then they looked, and right on top of many of the old scarps were the new scarps. So they used the geology to guide them, but then they also used the uh, aftershock. So they knew the belt of aftershocks. They knew roughly where it should be. And then also now, we started using some uh, INSAR. So radar interferometry is getting a kind of a sharp boundary and so then you can go with the helicopter right on top of that boundary and then look, you know, where's the damage or where's the ground rupture. And then I'll also talk in maybe when it comes to LIDAR, we started doing topographic differencing. So we can just take the topography before and take the topography after and we can compute the change. And then we could go look using that as well. So many combinations of approaches. It's well, it's good question. It's I think mostly was on the old scarf and it was mostly in the valley that's defined by the fault. So at five kilometer wide valley, the is mostly where the fault goes um, in this region. And but then it jumps around some. But here you can see, for example, this old scarp. And right along that old scarp was where the new one was. So it was pretty focused, mostly repeating what happened before. Uh, but the geologic width of the fault has made it kilometer. So the geology fractured rocks kilometer wide, and then uh, and that might have developed over a million years. And then over these time scales, that maybe a thousand years or two, ten thousand years, the fault tends to stay in one place, but then it may jump to another place, jump to another one. But in the, in the individual earthquake, as it repeats, it tends to stay on the most recent trace. It's a very good question. Uh, a really interesting one. It's kind of like one of the things we wanted to know is the stability of fault traces. How often does it make a new one? And especially for these big faults that are high slip rates, like this 10 millimeters a year, tends to stay always the same place. Boom, boom, boom. But in more low slip rate environments, more distributed fault pain sometimes does, you know, there was never an earthquake there before and there will never be one again. So you know, a good example is in um, Australia, mid-continent of Australia, 100,000 years between earthquakes in some places and just the new fault formed maybe every 100,000 years but following the old structure. So maybe 100 million year old fault gets reactivated but the next 100,000 years, there's another old fault that gets reactivated. So, but, so those are very low slip rates, like 0 0.001 millimeters per year. So 10,000 times lower rate than this one. So I think slip rate is a key factor in controlling the localization. Good, very good question. Okay, so let's look just a couple things, uh, structural geology points. So, you know, this, uh, we see the discontinuities from the earthquake. We know this fundamental. And so this is just some classical work with, uh, like clay over uh, a slit, a kind of a sheet with a slit and pulling on the side. We see the evolution actually it goes like this. It's left lateral. We see the evolution of the shear zone starting 
you know, with just distributed deformation, then this kind of really discontinuous faulting. And then as the shearing continues, the faults kind of grow and link. And so we see this, you know, in individual earthquakes, but really we see it in the evolution of these fault systems. And this kind of evolutionary setting uh, may control the continuity of the rupture. So the more smooth the fault is, in some ways, the longer the earthquake can be, and so maybe the bigger they will be. Whereas if it's very discontinuous, because it's young geologically, it may not be able to produce big earthquakes. So geology matters in terms of age of fault. So we also, maybe this is basic structural geology for shear zones. So, you know, we can make these structures, in this case, right lateral fault, we can have reverse faults, normal faults, some synthetic structures and folding, and we can make them, but then over time we shear them and they can rotate. And so uh, we can make new ones over printing the old ones, or we can reactivate these old ones because they're still zones of weakness. So this explains some of the complexity of surface rupturing. And then uh, another example we already now have seen of these steps and bends. So this is a right lateral fault with the right step. You get a little basin with these bounding normal faults. Come along left step, get a little uplift with bounding reverse faults. So kind of classical discontinuities along strikes of fault. Then this is the crazy picture, right? Like, this is from a structural geology textbook, so it's every possible thing you can imagine, you know, for the ends of faults, and then also the step over sort of geometries, and then all these secondary structures. So, it's just the point is that we, we can use our structural geology and faults to uh, help guide us to think about what to expect when we look at active faults. But we can go the other way and we can say, well, look at what we saw in this earthquake. How does it help us improve our generic model of how faults work? Okay, so then this happens not just in uh, mass view, but it also can happen in cross section. So what this is trying to show is sometimes these faults, they, they're they uh, coming along and they, they may have these sort of complex this is called a flower structure, right, or a duplex. And so the, and, and here you can see these step overs here. This is a map on the left. But when we cut the cross section, we can see maybe underneath is still a single through going fault surface. But as it comes to the surface, it's glazed. And so you can have kind of an extensional flower structure or contractional one, depending on how it deforms the crust and also the geometry, and the idea of flower is like petals of a flower, or sometimes I think palm tree, you know. So these are very interesting in terms of, again, structural geology of fault zones and how it builds topography. So, you know, if you have something like this and the earthquakes repeat, you can build a tectonic hill or a ridge that then we may see along a fault that helps guide us. So that was strikes with any questions? Okay, so let's do thrusting. So just a couple ones. This is uh, Chi Chi. So Taiwan earthquake 1999 uh, was magnitude 7.3 or 4. And you can see it's on a thrust fault that's um, on the west side of central Taiwan. And it's right in the kind of foothills of this major fold and thrust belt, and this one is, uh, you know, occurred in a pretty well urbanized environment, and so, for example, you can see this, this uh, track at a school was deformed and really sort of beautiful thrusting and folding of the track surface. Uh, and this is, if you remember, I showed the book, The Active Faults of the World Book by Yates. He has this, that picture on the cover. Um, it also, you know, affected, you can see, sorry, this is so small, but the fault scarp was thrust. So, it, it, you know, thrust faults, when they come to the surface, they tend to come on a low angle. They get to the surface and then they'll roll out over the old topography. And so this 
rollover of the thrust surface causes rotation of the immediate hanging wall. And so we see that rotation of the track, but we also see the rotation of this house. So the, the offset was really big. And you can see, so this is a very compact figure, but this is the same slip distribution. It's distance versus offset. And so in some places, the vertical offsets were six to eight meters. So no wonder this house was, was rotating. And then you see sometimes the rupture was sharp across the field. Here's a fold here. Here's another thrust front. So, um, again, it's important as we think of paleoseismology to always think of what the original forms are because paleoseismology for thrust systems is complicated because they, they tend to uh, go out flat like this and really what we see more is the folding above the, the front of the thrust than the offset itself. But there's some strike slip faulting you see here on the side. So, uh, right, right over in here was a little, actually, here's the strike slip on this end. So this just is a kind of quick example of a fairly compact thrust that with a shallow rollover in an urbanized, mostly urban and agriculturally dominated environment of Taiwan. So another example is a famous one from El Azna. So this is a older earthquake, uh, 1980, and it's in North Africa. So here's the Mediterranean. So this would be Algeria. So in North Central Africa on the south of Mediterranean. And the earthquake occurred. And so you see the, the focal mechanisms are here. And the ground rupture was, was out in this area. But what was so what was really interesting? So it makes sense, right? That if it's a reverse fault, the the uh, thrust tip is here, and then it goes down to the west, right, to the northwest, into the hypocenter, which would be down in the ground, you know, 10 kilometers or so down. Um, but what was really important about this was not just the reverse faulting, but also the secondary deformation. Some of the the folding and normal faulting that occurred on top of the thrust. And so here's an example, and this is a lot of words, I apologize, but here's the kind of the model for what they saw was the thrust came up and it broke the surface, but again, as it rolled over, the really spectacular ground cracking was actually normal faulting. So if you went there and you were kind of naive, you'd say, oh, it was a normal fault. You know, so you'd be getting in a fight with your colleague, but then the seismology guys would say, no, no, for sure, reverse focal mechanism. And so then you say, wow, well, what's going on? And then you look, oh, very subtle thrusting at the tip, but very spectacular extensional system on top. So that was this uh, crystal grabbing. Here's another example. So here it was oblique slip. It was uh, both thrusting as well as some in this case, left lateral shearing. And so what they mapped was this fault trace here, the thrust, but then this oblique crystal gravis. So it showed that the rupture was, was coming up and shearing. And so the, the tip rolled over, but the shear at depth kind of caused distributed shearing of the block above. And so again, very kind of spectacular extensional landscape, but more in echelon as opposed to the more parallel extension in this case, okay? And so the, the other thing that this did was it dammed the river. So this river here wanted to flow. It had been flowing through the fold, so the fold was known. So this earthquake occurred before as well. And here's the leveling, so some ge geodesy, not GPS. And so you can see that the fold lifted by five meters and this side subsided by about maybe one meter. And this five meters basically caused the river to dam. And so it made a lake behind it until it could get high enough to go over. And so one of the, this is a really good paleoseismic tool we can use. It's paleoseismic damming. And so you can do it by reverse faulting or 
you can also do it by strike slip. Sometimes if you have a river and you offset it like this, you can dam the upstream. And that change in base level can cause sedimentation that's directly associated with the earthquake. This also happens in more alpine environments. So, you know, if you're in the like, Central Asia and the Pamirs or Himalayas, many times there'll be big earthquakes. They shake all that valley wall down. It makes, also this happened in Wenchuan earthquake in China. It uh, made a big landslide dam, the big lake behind. And so on one hand, you can say, oh, that would be really interesting for us to study for the future, but it's another one of these secondary hazards because the landslide dam uh, may make the lake fill up quite high, and then the dam can fail. So in Wenchuan earthquake in China, they had to manage a couple of these landslide dams, and the army had to come, and they had to really manage it to stabilize it so it didn't burst, and everyone downstream would get flooded two weeks after the earthquake. So that was uh, just two thrusting. I can talk a lot about thrusting earthquakes in Central Asia, but and maybe I will when we come to feel the seismology of reverse systems. But I'm just going to keep going. But any questions? Questions? Yeah, it's. I think you know some of these examples are easy because they're big earthquakes and they're happening in the desert, right, or in low vegetation environments. If you have a smaller earthquake. The ground deformation may be not so strong, you know, less than one meter in the main fault zone. And uh, you may be really, as a geologist, distracted by adjacent landslides and secondary features. And so, you know, I don't have so much advice. It's just always to be very thorough, you know, just mapping, mapping, and trying to, to just gather as much data before making an interpretation. But also to be aware that sometimes the geometry can be quite complex. So seismologists might say, oh yeah, it's simple, reverse fault right here. And it is simple under the ground. But when it comes to the surface, the last kilometer can be quite complex. And so as a geologist, that's, you know, that's what we're dealing with. So all you can do is just carefully map and hopefully it will become a little clearer. There's some good examples from, uh, Japanese earthquakes, magnitude 6 or 6.5, where just little tiny pieces of rupture they can map, separated by a kilometer, and then huge landslides all around there. And it's just, I think it's, it's the landscape, the vegetation, and small magnitude earthquakes. So you have to map carefully. And if you have some tools like the high-resolution topography LIDAR, sometimes can help you because you can see through the vegetation and you may be able to see the signal better than you can in the field. So uh, you have to use many tools, I think. Good question. So how about another fault type, normal fault? Okay, so this one I know it's, I'm sorry because it's in the desert again, but uh, it's easy to see. So then it's in your mind, and if you worry about vegetation, put some trees on top of it. But this is from North America, from the basin and range. So Arizona, I remember our tour, I live down here. So there's uh, this broad range region of extension, you know, 500 kilometers wide. And parts of it are actively extending. So this is the uh, uh, intermountain seismic belt, so people know Utah, Salt Lake City, there's a big fault here called the Wasatch Fault. And also here in Nevada, there are some important, you know, mostly magnitude 7 earthquakes uh, in the middle of 20th century. But in 1983 was a magnitude 7.3 earthquake right here in Idaho. So part of the same system. And it made this beautiful scarf. So this is actually, I went there like in 1992, so 10 years later. And so you can still see the scarp pretty well. Here's a person, and the mountains are here. So this really nicely shows that the scarp occurred at the base of the mountains. And so we can see the same story, repeated slip in earthquakes that accumulates over time to build the topography and the geology. So here's the view right along the fault, and it went out like this. 
hairs from the face. You can see it's a, about two meter high scarf. But what's really in, amazing about it is you see behind it, see how it doesn't just go flat like this. The part becomes down smooth at the end, vertical. So this is an old scarf on top of the new one. The old one's 6,000 years old. So this earthquake occurred exactly in the same place as the last one did and uh, was really spectacular in that sense. So um, just quickly, I'll just show Okay, so, yeah, straight on view, she has this crazy hat on, it's cold there, but here's this thing. So, here's the kind of geology and the geodesy, and so this, this afternoon, for everyone who, if, if you will come to our exercise, we'll play around with how we can simulate this with dislocation. But the observations were deep, so here's the cross-section depth and distance. So here's the focal mechanism and the aftershock. So that's where the fault would be from a seismological perspective. Here's the geologic cross-section. So this normal fault's been there for a long time, made this basin, and this, you see this TEV is a tertiary volcanic. It's on the backside of the mountain. So we know the total offset on this uh, fault is like six or eight kilometers. So that volcanic rock is you know, it's tilted and it's like this now. But then this earthquake occurred right, just right on that fault. So we just, you know, maybe it's obvious, but these earthquakes are repeating on faults, sustained geologic slip manifest by earthquake after earthquake. And then this is elevation change in meter, millimeters from leveling. And so, and it's the same scale, 30 kilometers. And so what you can see is, the Earth, this is the co-seismic displacement field. So there's the, the offset on the fault is minus 1,200 to uh, 400. So it's like almost two meters, let's say 1.6 at this point. But there's a little bit of tilt off the back and then this long warping off the front. And this scale of this, this warping here goes with the depth of rupture. So we'll play around with this this afternoon and I'll, I'll show you the, the simple math that we can use to explore this behavior. So any questions on that? So here's the mapping and the slip distribution from the earthquake. And this is from the uh, Burbank and Anderson book. So here's north. So those pictures I was showing with the person uh, on, in front of the fault is is right, yeah, right here around this rock creek. And so there was a fairly coherent sort of rupture right in this area, a little complexity, and then it got quite complex and stepped to two zones here. And so then when you look at distance, you see only 35 kilometers, so ten, almost 10 times shorter than Denali, but it's also 7.3, not 7.9. And we see the overall slip distribution here is asymmetric, like we did see in Denali, with as much as two meters here around Rock Creek, where we had our example. Actually, we are at Double Spring Pass right here. Um, but then a high frequency variation in the geologic observation, and then some oblique slip, that's what these arrows are showing, as you get to the end, and then this long sort of tail of, um, of low slip. And so one thing uh, we were discussing earlier, remember this pulse model. So has anyone ever seen an earthquake and the earthquake rupture? And so there was a case here where some hunters were out, this woman and her husband were out this morning, this earthquake happened, and the, the, they separated and the, then the earthquake occurred. And so the woman was really nervous, but she was able to see and it's maybe easier to imagine looking here, she could see the earthquake come across the topography after. And so it's like a ribbon, it's like a zipper, so to say, you know, the, because you can see that the topography is kind of dark brown, and then but the scarf is kind of light. And so it just opened like this, like a zipper, just... <laughs> and so this opening this ribbon appeared and she could see it move across. And so 
the rear end opens at, it comes about a kilometer per second, the rupture of the front. And then the slippage in the earthquake occurs in about a meter per second. So the rupture front goes like this, slippage occurs like this. So at any one point, the motion's over in about two seconds. And then the pulse comes by, which means that basically the end of the pulse is stoppage. So if it's a kilometer or so per section, per second, a rupture in a meter per second, it's about two kilometer long pulse, just poof, along the fault. So the whole thing doesn't go down like this at once. It, it tears. It's a big thought. Um, the other story is a kind of slightly funny one, where uh, these other two guys were out hunting, but some American traditions of hunting, including drinking alcohol instead of actually hunting, maybe other traditions too. So they were, it's like six in the morning, and they were, they didn't feel like hunting. So they were sitting in their truck, drinking, and they were, and then they, the cars are moving like this. And so they looked at each other, they're like, what, what's going on? You know, are you getting sick or something? And then right in front of them, poof, the fault, oh, the displacement occurred, just like 10 meters in front of them. And so the car's going like this, but the road was completely, like, taller than the car in like two seconds. So then they were, you know, really shocked. And this uh, famous U.S. geo scientist, Bob Wallace, a very famous guy, he interviewed them, and he was very careful. And he said, well, they were drinking alcohol, but I think their observations are reliable. And so he went through, and he said, well, you know, uh, what they saw and how long it took to occur. And, and so, but these were some of the first obviously recorded uh, observations of earthquakes. I mean, people seem like, it's really the rupture pulse observation that is rare. Everyone sees the ground shake. So, anyway, that's uh, an example, just a story from normal faulting. And so, just like the other faults, there are these discontinuities. So, I showed steps and bends for normal, for strike step faults. Same thing happens for uh, normal faults. We have, in an isolated case, a single fault has a tip, and in the middle, and usually, if we do displacement versus length, we'll have this kind of symmetric in a perfectly theoretical case, slip distribution. But then as they, they um, become kind of approaching each other and are discontinuous, we have two peaks. And so this starts to maybe explain why these ruptures are, are you know, not single hump. It's because we have rupture on multiple fault surfaces near each other. And during, in the transfers or relay zones, like this one, the slip may go quite low. And this happens in all faults, but it's uh, well studied for normal faults. And so there's names for these things, like separation is the, the width perpendicular to the faults between the two. And then there's overlap, which is you know, the distance parallel, and it can be over or underlap, which means that they don't actually uh, aren't across from each other. And then there's something that happens that forms in the normal faults, especially called these relay ramps. And the important thing, and lots of work has been done, and when we talk about tectonic geomorphology, we may spend some time, is these discontinuities really affect the, the drainage. So you can imagine a steep river on the front of the fault, but a more complex river pattern that slows down the relay, uh, and, and then more short, steep ones. So sometimes you can read the geometry of the fault from the drainage network. So some more names, uh, features in this model. And it gets more complicated. So this is another Burbank and Anderson, the tectonic geomorphology book. So, you know, the, if the, it's simple if the faults dip the same, but if they dip opposite each other, you get this, you know, this antithetic interbasin ridge, or um, we can just simply have a scissoring kind of thing, like this transfer fault, synthetic relay, antithetic interference. So lots of complexity we can see. And so then this is actually an East African Rift example where it's uh, really even more complicated with maybe some fairly simple zones and just tapering and then breaking up, but then more complex um, geometries, multiple faults, and then these kind of com complex polygonal transfer zones. So probably the stresses are not constant in space in this system. 
And there could be, especially in East Africa, can be some volcanic influences that will change the local threat state, make the fault pattern more complex. Um, and also there can be inherited structures. So the East African rift cuts across other structures in Africa, in the African lithosphere. And as you sometimes cut new faults across old faults, this changes the, the kind of character of the rupture, or may, ruptures may break them up a little bit. So that's the end of this lecture, which is uh, was the geometry of active faults. Just some examples to show. There's many that we could show. Um, 